decision. Welcome to the D-List, the show where I list things and my name begins with a D. One of those things is true on my other shows, too. And today we are going hilariously evil as I talk about some of my favorite villains in comedy. And by that I don't just mean funny bad guys, I mean characters who work both as comedic characters and as effective villains. Comedic villains are deceptively difficult to do well. A good comedy villain needs to be able to make you laugh, yes, but also pose a legitimate threat. And it's far too easy for laughter to completely take the edge off a situation. But there are some villains in fiction who are able to successfully switch back and forth between funny and scary, and sometimes be both at once. I'm going to talk about a few of my favorites who I think fit the bill. <laughs> Number 9. Alternate versions of Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz from Phineas and Ferb. Danville's resident evil scientist using innator after innator to attempt to take over the entire tri-state area. I actually hesitated to include Doof on this list. Not because I don't love him, indeed I think he's one of the funniest characters on television today, but because most of the time he's not actually a villain. No matter how hard he tries to be one. You think I'm evil, right? Thank you, Perry the Platypus. Thank you. Yes, he's ostensibly the main villain of the show, even though in every canon episode he and the title characters are completely unaware of each other's existence. But he usually doesn't quite have what it takes to actually be the villain. He wants to be evil, but when he's not stopped by Perry, he's stopped by his own incompetence, yes, but also his own compassion and innate goodness. Ah, I'm going to have to do the right thing here, aren't I? But once in a while, we get a peek at some alternate realities. Realities with a version of Doof who actually is in power and actually is evil. The first is an alternate future where Candace's success in busting her brothers inadvertently led to Doofenshmirtz's success in ruling with an iron fist. Yeah, his evil is still largely played for laughs, but it's still an oppressive dictatorship where everybody wants to bend over backwards for him to the point of everybody having the same name just so we won't have to remember who people are. And it serves as legitimate stakes for the episode. It's gotten really hard to defeat Doofenshmirtz ever since we swore that oath to obey him. But even more terrifying is the Doofenshmirtz from an alternate dimension. A Doofenshmirtz who only needed a solitary mild backstory to become evil and all-powerful. A Doofenshmirtz who literally reprogrammed Perry to carry out his bidding. A Doofenshmirtz who outlaws summer, encourages slave labor, and has no qualms about murdering children, animals, and less competent versions of himself. If I had a nickel for every time I was doomed by a puppet, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? And then we literally get to see our Doof's innate goodness in conflict with Alternative Doof's unstoppable evilness. And I say the whole thing is way better than any Disney Channel original movie deserves to be. Double Doof and Schmerz coming at you Fridays! <laughs> Number 8. Sideshow Bob from The Simpsons. He's a murderous Frasier with carrot top hair who's out for revenge. There's really nothing else I need to say about him. You know you love Sideshow Bob. I remember hearing he was supposed to be in The Simpsons movie, but his scene got deleted, but the deleted scene's not on the DVD, so what the hell, Fox? Still, at least the ride's all about him. <laughs> Number seven. It wouldn't be a list of villains on the internet without Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker. In the grand tradition of creepy clowns, the Joker defines himself by a sense of humor. He takes on the role of Gotham's jester, mocking Gotham's institutions in the deadliest way. His sense of humor is exactly what's so terrifying about him. He takes nothing seriously, least of all human life. And his jokes can often be hilarious and quotable, coming from a fictional character. From a real person, it would be disturbing at best. If, like me, you were at a midnight screening of The Dark Knight, you might recall people who laughed, cheered, and applauded at the pencil trick. Heath Ledger got laughter, cheers, and applause for impaling a man's brain on a pencil. That's the kind of disturbing power this character can have over the audience in the hands of the right performer. There's nothing I can say about Ledger's Joker that hasn't already been said, but there have been a lot of interpretations of the Joker, and each incarnation finds its own place on the funny to creepy scale. 
Cesar Romero, for instance, rightfully went for all laughs in keeping with the comedic tone of that particular show. Ooh, a joke a day keeps the gloom away! Mark Hamill would occasionally lean in one direction or the other, depending on the episode, but whichever side he was on in a given moment, he absolutely nailed it. Jack Nicholson was... mostly playing Jack Nicholson in makeup. And he had a lot of very funny lines, but his Jack Nicholson-nitty helped make it unsettling. Everyone has their own favorite version of Batman's relationship with the Joker, and their own favorite version of the Joker himself. Me, I gotta give it to Strong Bat. I've always been a fan of his particular brand of anarchy. <laughs> Number six. Hello, friend. Gideon. Lil Gideon Gleeful from Gravity Falls. At first glance, Gideon seems comically unthreatening. He's a tacky performer, he's continuously failed to take over the Mystery Shack, and of course... He's so little! As a broad comic character, he combines the stereotypes of a cheesy televangelist with the stereotypes of a whiny, petulant, spoiled child. Of course, a spoiled child can also be a real nightmare. His father just rolls with it, presumably because Gideon's a cash cow. I can buy and sell you, old man! Fair enough. But what did he do to traumatize his poor mother? Just keep back in it. Just keep back him in. Much of Gideon's conflict with Grunkle Stan takes the form of relatively harmless, petty, childish rivalry. Deal with it. But it doesn't take long for Dipper and Mabel to encounter his darker, more manipulative side. And while he may be a small, non-threatening child, he has access to all sorts of unpredictable magic and a willingness to call upon powers even he knows he should be afraid of. There's no telling what Gideon will unleash, and his rush to deal with the darkest forces imaginable with little hesitation is truly alarming, and it yields some of the scariest threats in a town already loaded with unknowable powers. But that's only scary when you actually know he has powers. Grunkle Stan's ignorance, whether willful or not, to Gideon's evil magic ensures that he sees the kid as no more than a nuisance. Stan's oblivious to the peril he faces, and only sees how ludicrous this kid actually is, keeping the comedy alive at even the most dangerous moment. Come down soon, folks. Gideon is expecting you. <laughs> Number five. Asshole! Otto from A Fish Called Wanda. A pretentious yet crass American jewel thief who thinks he's smarter than he is. Don't, uh, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. Call me stupid. Constantly lies and double crosses his teammates, and has a very, very, very short temper. You pompous, stuck up, snot nosed, English giant, twerp, scumbag, fuck face, dickhead, asshole! And that short temper leads to both some of the film's biggest laughs and some of its deadliest stakes. He may not be the most powerful villain. He's primarily played for laughs, and he's never actually in control. Wanda is playing him from the very start. But he still poses a legitimate threat to Archie Leach's happiness and well-being. Dangling Archie out of a window is a great sight gag, but it also reminds us of the risks here. If Otto is set off the wrong way, Archie could die. This movie isn't afraid to kill old ladies or puppies, so it could totally kill John Cleese. His threats are mostly comical, and he's disposed of comically, but he's still the primary source of any actual danger the movie has. And he's so entertaining that Kevin Klein won a well-deserved Oscar for the role. That's right, an Oscar went to a comedic performance in a film that's more fun than self-important. Maybe Otto really is a master manipulator. What was the middle thing? <laughs> Number four, Gaston from Disney's Beauty and the Beast. The idiot jock pickup artist alpha douche who keeps harassing the unassuming nerdy girl. Gaston's machismo and vanity is played pretty consistently for humor in the first half of the movie, especially in the song that bears his name. Like many songwriters, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman would use nonsense temp lyrics when working out a song, before filling them in with the final lyrics. Reportedly for Gaston, they just kept the temp lyrics in the final song. Except for the temp lyrics that were vulgar and filthy. The end result is an absurd collection of meaningless boasts and nonsensical ego stroking. But of course, he also has a menacing undercurrent. As funny as his ego is, his lack of respect for Belle's boundaries is just... evil. He knows she's not interested, and he doesn't care. He thinks she belongs with him anyway, and doesn't even consider her choice in the equation. Oh, and he rallies everybody to follow him and murder the object of her affections, because obviously she'll marry him then, right? We all know jerks like Gaston in real life. If we're lucky, we don't know any who are as extreme as Gaston. 
And this character allows us to laugh at those jerks' awfulness without diminishing the danger said awfulness can lead to. Still, I suppose Gaston has a bit of a good side. He does devote some time to important PSAs. You don't need alcohol to be cool, kids. <laughs> Number three, LeChuck from the Monkey Island games. The most feared pirate in the Caribbean. The mention of his name sends terror throughout Melee Island. A bloodthirsty buccaneer who just won't stay dead. And who may or may not be your brother, depending on how seriously you take the goofy Star Wars joke that Ron, Tim, and Dave ended the second game with. And like everybody in the Monkey Island universe, he has a lot of really funny lines. I'll blast my significant other into the significant other world! <laughs> That'll show her how much I truly care. And some that are funny and disturbing. I will take your bones, still alive and in great pain, and make them into a chair. I will call it my screaming chair. Every morning I will sit in it and listen to you scream. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so throughout the various installments in the Monkey Island franchise, LeChuck has had varying degrees of humor or threat about him. In the first two games, he has quite a few funny lines, but he's still generally portrayed as a serious antagonist. In Curse of Monkey Island, he was still dangerous and imposing, thanks in no small part to the kick-ass voice work of Earl Bowen. Ooh, the lass has spirit -y. AKA this doctor guy from the Terminator movies. But he was starting to lean toward the goofier side. Bring me my bride! And more slaw! And then in Escape, he lost just about any sense of threat he had, being reduced to a stooge for a land developer. And he didn't say much that was particularly funny either. Fortunately, Tales of Monkey Island came along, and did a masterful job luring you into a false sense of security with LeChuck, only to sucker punch you in the end. Especially if you played each chapter as it was originally coming out. Earl Bowen originally didn't return for the early chapters, Demon LeChuck was voiced by Adam Harrington, and Human LeChuck was voiced by Kevin Blackton, both of whom did admirable jobs, but they had enormous shoes to fill. But once he turns back into a voodoo demon at the end of chapter 4... Aren't you dead yet? I've got wedding plans to make! There's the LeChuck we know and fear. Bowen is back. The final sequence from the final chapter is incredibly intense, and yet LeChuck's taunts are still humorous. Piracy is already delightfully villainous to begin with, but at his best, LeChuck takes it to the next level. <laughs> Number two. I'm a slasher, and I must be stopped. You're a what? A slasher. Of prices. <laughs> Just kidding. Simon Skinner from Hot Fuzz. One of the greatest action comedies of all time brings us one of the greatest over-the-top obvious villains of all time. When a series of mysterious deaths occur in the seemingly peaceful town of Sanford, all signs point to Simon Skinner as the villain. And he doesn't seem to have any interest in diverting suspicion away from himself. Once again, the same thing that makes the character funny also makes him threatening. Timothy Dalton plays Simon Skinner with just the right amount of hammy overacting to make him hilarious to watch, but also genuinely terrifying at moments. His theatricality demonstrates his complete lack of fear as he constantly flaunts his crimes in Angel's face, knowing that he can't be caught. And there's nothing scarier than a powerful enemy who's not scared of you. Later in the film, we discover the real reason Skinner's not afraid. Nearly the entire town is on his side. There is almost nobody Angel can trust. Even when it's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Skinner is the villain, he knows he has Angel outnumbered. There's no possible way he can lose. Fortunately for Angel, Skinner underestimates his ability to become an equally over-the-top movie cop. See? See? Doing nothing but watching movies might save your life one day! Whose couch potato tendencies are causing them to waste their potential now, high school guidance counselor? <laughs> and my number one favorite villain in comedy, Biff Tannen from the Back to the Future trilogy. Yes, I know at one point he was evicted by someone lower on this list, but for me he's still number one! The very funny but very scary Biff Tannen, played by the very funny and very friendly Tom Wilson, seems to have nothing better to do than to terrorize George McFly and harass Lorraine Baines well into adulthood. 
Like many bullies, Biff isn't the brightest gigawatt in the lightning bolt, and his lack of smarts leads to some endlessly quotable one-liners. With all due respect to Don't Call Me Shirley, the funniest line of dialogue in cinema history will always be, So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? But he doesn't need intelligence to be physically imposing. Indeed, his inability to think things through leads to a recklessness that is unquestionably threatening. Not to mention a complete lack of respect for sexual boundaries. Yeah, that's still really, really evil. Yes, he's cowardly when his power is taken away from him, but when he's at the top of the food chain, or even just out of earshot of the people who scare him, there's no telling what he'll do to the people he decides to hate. And the whole Tannen family has a few screws loose. Biff's grandson Griff is even more cartoony with his cybernetic implants, but his goofy voice is also unsettling. Since when did you become the physical type? His great-grandfather Buford Mad Dog Tannen has some of the funniest bits in the whole trilogy. Like I said, we'll finish this tomorrow! Tomorrow we're robbing the Pan City stage. What about Monday? We doing anything Monday? Uh, no, Monday be fine. You can kill him on Monday. I'll be back this way on Monday. But he also murdered Doc Brown. And... Possibly Marshall Strickland, if deleted scenes are canon. Once again, the same things that make Biff funny in one scene also make him dangerous in the next, so the tone can shift gears without losing either important facet. It makes for a delightfully despicable villain we love to hate throughout the whole trilogy. And there you have it, my own personal comedy rogues gallery. So, who's your favorite funny antagonist? Let me know in the comments, and let me know if there's anything you'd like me to list in a future episode. Good luck fighting the forces of evil! or the forces of good, depending on which side you're on. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.